Praise the Lord. We'll stand up as we pray together. A great God in heaven, we do thank you today for the Bible study. We thank you for the revelation of your will, your mind, your thought unto every one of your children. Thank you, Lord, because you have not left us in darkness. To just grope about in the darkness and the dimness of this world. But you have revealed what you want. And you have revealed the way of blessing. How we can live a happy life, a holy life, a healthy life in this world. How the life we live can be prosperous and successful. And how we can live our lives here on earth in such a way that when we die, when we leave this realm of death and sorrow and evil, we can be with you forever. Lord, we pray as we open the pages of the scriptures to teach us, instruct us, even tonight. We pray, Lord, our hearts will receive your word in Jesus' name. And we pray that your blessing will be great and mighty upon everyone. Pour out the resources and the blessings, the showers of heaven upon every life tonight. Keep us awake. Help us to hear what you are saying. Cancel the thoughts that are wrong. And we pray, Lord, our lives will be beautiful and wonderful before you. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. We come to a Bible study tonight. And it's always my pleasure to see all of you here wanting to soak in and sink in the word of God. I want in this word to so saturate your life, influence your life. And I pray that as you come with the right attitude, you'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. We're back to the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, we're looking at a very special section. And that's the section of Matthew chapter 7. Reading from verse 7 all through to verse 11. Open your Bible with me. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. For what man is there of you, whom if his son ask him bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him those are the verses we're looking at tonight and as you look at your outline you will see we're talking on the assurance of answered prayer for everyone that word assurance is very, very important. The reason why that is important is it's not only Christian people that pray. There are people that take prayer as a religious ritual, as a religious duty. In fact, there are some people that count their prayers one, two, three, four, five every day. And once they have gone through one, two, three, four, five, they have fulfilled the religious duty. In particular, they're not thinking about answer to the prayer. They're not thinking about heaven responding unto them, just a duty. Other people do it just for advertisement, for show. The Pharisees were very clever at that. Because the nation of Israel, they, they associated spirituality with prayer. They thought Abraham was spiritual, he prayed. And Moses was spiritual, he prayed. And David was spiritual, he prayed. Daniel was a spiritual man, he, he prayed. So, if anybody in the nation was looking for a spiritual man, they'll be looking for something in his life. They'll be looking at whether he prays or not. 
And so the Pharisees wanted to convince people that it was spiritual. And the only way they could do that was to pray and pray and pray. But it was all for show. It was all for advertising the commodity, the, uh, the kind of goods they didn't have. Uh, don't you know there are people who advertise what they don't have? They put a sign in front of their shop. Come for this. Come for this. If you make a mistake to go in there, they say, well, the thing ran out. We don't seem to have today what we're looking for. Come another time. Those Pharisees and Sadducees did not have any spiritual life. But they advertised spirituality by praying. And that's why it's very important to underline the word assurance. Not only that, as you call me to the Christian body, there are many people in the Christian body that pray. In fact, if they don't pray, they say a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. But they do not understand how to have answers to their prayers. That's the reason why as we come today and we're looking at this passage once again. We're looking at what the passage says about assurance, about the confidence, about the absolute certainty you can have that when you pray, the Lord does answer the prayer. By the way, prayer is a very great privilege. It's a privilege we have not studied enough, we have not learned enough, we have not practiced enough. Every believer and every preacher would do more good in life if you knew what Christ taught in this passage. Every believer, if you will take what the Lord is saying here, you take it to heart. You'll do more good if you will add real quality prayer into your life. Every other good thing you do, you don't drop them, you keep them, you hold on to them, you keep on practicing them. But you add quality time, what faith, into praying. You add that into your Christian life, you're going to do quite a lot. And every preacher, every servant of God, every minister of the gospel, if we will add just this into our lives, do you know that prayer will do much more than anybody can do on earth? Because it makes you to have the assistance of the power of God and the assistance of the power of omnipotence to work along with you. That's why what we're studying is so very important. It will do us a world of good. To lay all excuses aside. All speculative theories on prayer aside and take the words of Jesus Christ at face value. What are those words? Ask. And it shall be given you. Take that at face value. Take that exactly as Jesus said it. Seek and you shall find. Take that and don't change it. Don't mutilate it. Modify it. Just do it as he said. And then he said knock and you shall find. What a world of good it will do for you and for me. If we take those words of Jesus at face value, Christ himself prayed and he got supernatural answers like no other person before him or even after him. And his teaching on prayer is higher than any man's understanding, any man's concept, any man's theory on prayer as the heavens are higher than the earth. Our Lord and Savior assures us of the absolute certainty of prayers, of answers to our prayers. See the way he says it in verse 8. For everyone that asks, receiveth. Everyone that asks, receiveth. You'll find there are two verbs there. Asking, receiving. The asking precedes the receiving. He is asking. He asks. That's in the continuous tense. And he receives also in the continuous tense. He gives us the assurance by saying, And he that seeketh, findeth. He says, You might seek many things on earth by yourself. And you may not find. But if you are seeking by prayer, 
Anytime you've lost something, anytime you desire something, anytime you are longing for something, anytime you want something very essential, very important in your life, he that seeketh, findeth, what a great assurance that is. And then he says, to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. He tells us that if you ask, you'll find, you seek, you seek, you're going to, you're going to find. And then if you knock, it will be open unto you. He, the son of God, is a perfect example for all the sons of God. And you know when Jesus prayed, he had the assurance that the father always answered him. He said at the tomb, at the grave of Lazarus, father, I sing thee that thou hast heard me and i knew that thou hearest me always every time if you could just have that kind of faith that kind of trust that kind of confidence and you can always go to god in prayer even before you make your request and you say lord i thank you i'm worshiping you because i know before I even make my request, I know that you're going to answer me because you hear me always. What a great confidence and trust that will be. The Lord Jesus prayed with absolute trust and peaceful confidence. His expectation was based on his relationship with the Heavenly Father. That is the true basis for firm expectation in prayer. Relationship. Or the heavenly father because if you don't have any relationship with the father you cannot have absolute assurance you cannot just rush into the presence of the lord and say lord here is what i need here is what i want here is what i demand do this for me what's your relationship with the lord if you look at john chapter 9 verse 31 john chapter 9 Verse 31, it says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. Think about that. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. That means a sinner cannot really have absolute assurance. He may have a kind of assurance, but it's the assurance of a deceived heart. A kind of assurance he cannot find any footing, any ground, any basis, any ground in scripture. It's when you have you have turned away from your sin, you have turned unto the Lord, you have been at Calvary spiritually, and you have allowed the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away your sin. And then the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart. You are a child of God. It is then with that relationship, father-child relationship, like Jesus Christ and the assurance. It is when you have that assurance, you'll be able to come and say, Father, here is my request. Here is my prayer item. And the Lord will answer. In that verse 31, now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will. If any man be a worshiper of God, that's not the end, and doeth his will. That's how you can have assurance. Then it says, then he heareth him. Him will he hear. In fact, those who are sinning, those who are living in sin, whatever their religion, whatever church they're associated with, and whatever kind of testimony, some superficial testimonies they give, if they're living in sin, they don't have any relationship with the Lord. And then they might act bold, and they might talk with assurance, but that assurance will be disappointed for the whole world to see. We're told in Psalm 7 verse 11. Psalm 7 verse 11. God judges the righteous. God looks at the motives of the righteous. He judges the actions of the righteous. He judges the steps of the righteous. He evaluates. He examines 
the steps of the righteous to see whether they're good or not. And then it says in the second part, and God is angry with the wicked every day. God is angry with the wicked every day. The wicked that is practicing is wickedness from Monday to Saturday. And then to cover up, he comes to church on Sunday. He ought to know that that Sunday will not make a difference because the wicked man, a wicked woman, God is angry with the wicked every day. It is when you turn from the wickedness, you turn away from the sin, and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and there is forgiveness, and there is a transformation, and there is a change. Because the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. When the old lifestyle of wickedness is passed away, then is the anger of God, the wrath of God, away from your life. But while the wickedness is still there, while the sin is still there, God is angry with the wicked every day. How about his prayer? A wicked man, a wicked woman, an unrighteous man, an unrighteous woman. How about his prayer? Her prayer. In Proverbs chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 9. Proverbs chapter 28, reading from verse 9. He that turneth away is ear from hearing the law. Even his prayer shall be abomination. He that turneth away is ear from hearing the word of God. He doesn't want to hear about repentance. He doesn't want to hear about restoration. He's not interested in restitution. He's not interested in righteousness. As to coach the word of God and you talk about righteousness and holiness and the demand of God no he doesn't want to hear that all he wants to do is to pray and to pray and to pray but he says he that turneth away is here from hearing the law even his prayer shall be abomination that's the reason why we need to understand that before a sinner can have an assurance that God will answer his prayer, he must pray the first prayer that God is waiting for. What's that prayer? Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Lord, I know that Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am chief. He must pray the false prayer and turn away from evil and eat my people, that is the nominal church goers who are called by my name, will humble themselves and seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, I will heal their land. That is the first theme, the first point. And that is the first scene and the first point, the first gate at which the sinner will enter, sins now forgiven, the body and the guilt of sin taken away. And then being a child of God now, he can talk to the Lord and the Lord will answer his prayer. I said the Lord will answer his prayer with Christ as his Savior, with God as his Father. The promises of God to all the members of his family will now be his. And with proper relationship with God, we can now ask and receive when whatever the father has promised to his children. As we look at the study tonight, you already know the topic, assurance of answered prayer for everyone. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the impartiality of God. God in answering prayer. The impartiality of God in answering prayer. Look at verse 8. For everyone that asketh receiveth impartiality. Everyone. And he that seeketh findeth everyone. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. The impartiality of God in answering prayer. Point number 2. 
The impossibility of getting antithetic answers in prayer. That word antithetic means the opposite, anti, antithetic, sympathetic. You're sympathizing with antithetic. You're talking about something against because of that word anti there. And the impossibility of getting antithetic answers in prayer. That means if you ask for something good, it will not give you something evil. If you ask for something that will make you happy, it will not give you something that will make you sorrowful. If you ask for something that is positive, it will not give you something negative. Where is that? Look at verse 9. Or what man is there of you? Whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? The answer is no. Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? The answer is no. That means it's impossible for God to give you the opposite of what you are asking. Point number three. Insight into God's affection for his people. Insight into God's affection. For his people, his love, his compassion, his mercy for his people. And look at verse 11. If he then been evil, not to give good things, good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things? Your father in heaven, give good things to them that ask him. Let's come to point number one. The impartiality of God in answering prayer. We're coming to Matthew chapter 7 verse 8. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. You shall put your name in that place. When you ask, the Lord will give you. And you tonight and any time when you seek, you will find and you in particular when you knock at the door the mercy of God God will open that door to you in Jesus name you see there are always people that uh, they go back to the old covenant and, and sometimes you know it shocks you when you find people that have the whole bible in their hands and they're still going back to the old testament it's like they never know they can ask anything from God by themselves they're still thinking that Moses will pray for me. They're thinking Joshua is the one that has the ear of God, the attention of God. They are thinking that it is David that will be able to pray for me. They are thinking it is prophet Elijah that will be able to pray for me. They are thinking if I can just get hold of prophet Elisha, he will pray for me. They are thinking if I can get hold of prophet Jeremiah, he will pray for me. Their thought is only Daniel knows how to pray. But you come to the new covenant and it is different. And you know the way you did it before you became a Christian. The unfortunate thing is that many people are still trying to do that now that they have become children of God. When we were in those white garment churches, you know what we used to do? We couldn't pray by ourselves. We'll go to the prophet, the white garment prophet, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. And those people did not have any other job they were doing. They were there, you give them money, then they will fast and they will pray. As you look at the Christian community today in Nigeria, and you look at the Christian community in the whole of Africa, the same thing, the same thing. Only that not everybody is wearing the white garment. They may wear coats, but they do like the white garment people. They may wear whatever they wear, but they do like the white garment people. They put themselves there. They are the only people that can pray. And then, let's leave all the other churches. Let's come to Deeper Life Bible Church. With all that we learn in the faith clinics, with everything that we learn at the retreat, at the workers' retreat, at the congress at the special meetings at the covenant sundays combined services every time and even with all the bible studies we have the knowledge in our head but we have the white garment 
kind of uh, practice in our heart. We still do not know everyone that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. We still have that white garment kind of mentality. And then we think somebody is there like Moses, like Elijah, like Elisha, like Daniel, like David, like Jeremiah, like Isaiah, like John the Baptist. And then we rush to him wherever he is. And he is the only one that can pray. I think we need to come back to the New Testament. And then understand, now the privilege is ours. The promises are ours. Everyone that asketh receiveth. And you know, sometimes, you know, as a pastor, I need to not only teach, we must practice what we teach. And if you know, our mothers know that, our mothers, when they deliver a baby, then they're giving meal to that baby. And then the mother decides that this is the time now that this child ought to start eating by himself and therefore the mother will withdraw the milk for babies you are not a baby anymore go on a greater diet a, a higher level of diet and then the child will be crying and kicking and do whatever but mothers know if you yield to that crying and kicking that child will remain a baby for life and pastors have to do that sometimes you know sometimes yeah, people are watching is the pastor there have this headache he must pray for me especially after the Sunday service is the pastor there I have this too much trouble he must pray for me and then I'm wondering what's all that we have been learning we ought to grow and thank God we're growing I say thank God we're growing and so I take that feeding bottle away from the church and there are some people that you know they shake and they cry and they kick and they do a lot of things because the feeding bottle of praying for stomach ache and headache and praying for your bone and praying for your eyes and praying for this and that after every Sunday service because that is not there we kick but I'm trying to get you out of the Old Testament concept I'm trying to get you to practice what you learn and then to take all those messages of faith and listen to them over and over by yourself and then you are going to become a giant in praying. But you know, if I keep on giving you the feeding bottle every time, you'll not grow. I know as I'm saying that there are people that are saying, do you mean you are not going to wait after next Sunday service? That's exactly what I'm saying. If you don't want to come to service because I'm taking your feeding bottle away, well, that means you don't love the Lord. I'm not going to keep on with that feeding bottle, with that Old Testament concept. We're going to come to the New Testament phase and we're going Going to stand on this word of God, everyone that asketh receiveth. And from tonight, you are going to begin to receive. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing where you can stand up by yourself and then stand on the promises of God like we see and then claim those promises of God and receive an answer? And then you can say, I prayed and God answered me. God will put a testimony in your mouth. We're looking at Luke chapter 11 verse 10. Luke chapter 11 and reading from verse 10. In Luke 11 verse 10, still saying the same thing, just to be doubly sure. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. God will open the door for me. I said God. God will open the door for me. He'll open it for you. And you know, you have to knock by yourself. You have to knock by yourself. You won't have an Elijah knocking for you every time, an Elisha knocking for you every time, a David, a Joshua knocking for you every time. There comes a time when you grow up and you understand everyone that asketh receives. He that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh, 
it will be open in numbers chapter 21 numbers chapter 21 here the uh, people had done something wrong and they were being beaten by snakes and like they used to do baby believers toddlers crawling they went to Moses and they said pray for us well Moses still prayed but he wasn't praying for them one by one he prayed for them generally which is what I'm doing every time you come I pray for you and you know I send the blessings to you there and you are going to catch it and then they said pray for us and then Moses prayed for them and then God said Moses says what you're going to do you raise up a brazen serpent so that each person will grow up each person will have something to do in Numbers chapter 21 I'm reading from verse 8 and the Lord said unto Moses make thee a fairy serpent and set it upon a pole and it shall come to pass that everyone that is beaten when he looketh upon it shall live there's something for you to do by yourself that you need to pray by yourself seek by yourself ask by yourself knock by yourself in verse 9 and moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole and it came to pass that if a serpent had beaten any man when he beheld the serpent of brass when he beheld the serpent of brass he lived he had to do that for himself and that's why many people are not saved they don't know how to pray by themselves to get saved that's why many people are not sanctified they do not know how to go to the Lord and claim the promise of sanctification pray by themselves and get sanctified that's why many people are not filled with the Holy Ghost dynamic power of God from heaven you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you that's why many people have been on that point of I'm saved I'm sanctified for many years they have never had this beautiful language from heaven and the power of the Holy Ghost in their lives. They do not know how to seek the Lord by themselves. That's why many people are weak spiritually. They are not strong. They do not know he, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They cannot wait upon the Lord by themselves you see as we look at all the churches in the country in our country here and in our continent africa that is the spiritual disease and it's like you know the pastors of the churches and all those are great great ministers they encourage for the whole church to remain in the baby stage and they never teach us how we can take hold of the arm of the of god by ourselves but that's what the Lord is leading us to do at this time. And God will lead us to actually pray. And we're going to get answers to our prayers. We're looking at Psalm 32 verse 6. Psalm 32. We're looking at verse 6. In Psalm 32 verse 6. For they shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee. Everyone that is godly. How calm. A lot of people are saved and sanctified and they are righteous, they are godly and yet they cannot pray by themselves. They cannot pray on their own. They cannot lay hold on the promises of God by themselves. And the preachers, the pastors, the leaders in the church, they love it like that. They, they make it like that that they do not encourage each individual in fact let me use another word they do not force each individual to pray by himself and yet it says over here in verse 6 for they shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found and then it says surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nice unto him thou art my hiding place thou shalt preserve me from trouble thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance God will deliver you 
in Psalm 65. Psalm 65. I'm reading from verse 2. Psalm 65, verse 2. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall tell me the rest. All flesh come. Uh, you know, I've been telling you how they do it in, you know, those uh, white garment uh, churches. How they do it now in evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatic churches. How they do it now in deeper life. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall the pastor, the overseer come. And all the others are just sitting on the bench to take their turn one by one. We do not know. Neither do we practice what the Lord is beckoning on us to practice. This is your right. This is your privilege. You will pray and God will answer. All flesh unto thee shall all flesh come. If you are going to be saved, you have to pray by yourself. If you are going to be sanctified, you have to pray by yourself. If you can get salvation, which is greater than healing, by praying yourself, why can't you get healing and deliverance and other things? The things that are smaller, less than salvation. If you get salvation, if you get a change of heart, if you get sanctification, if you get the power of the Holy Ghost by yourself, and there's no other way if you get a ticket to heaven if you are able to go through this narrow gate that leads to the narrow way that leads to paradise to heaven if you are able to do that by yourself how is it you cannot lay hold on the promise of God by yourself and receive a new day has come you will receive you will go to the Lord with trust, with faith, with confidence. Because it says, everyone that asketh receiveth. Isaiah chapter 55, I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 55. And I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah 55, verse 1. Oh, everyone that thirsteth, see that again. Everyone. Everyone that thirsteth. You know something? Look up here, brothers and sisters. And when you want to do something you have never done, it will look difficult. It will look awkward. It will look as if you can never do this. But there must be a day you will start. Look at that. My brother there is uh, learning how to repair vehicles. And he's in the mechanic shop and the uh, master who is training him he is an apprentice and the master is training he's always under that scene and bring that and bring this and bring this and uh, you know this apprentice is always looking always looking always looking but one day the master says do this yourself then he becomes afraid do you remember the time you wanted to learn how to ride a bicycle? You know, people have been taking on the bicycle, having a jolly good ride. And then one day they say, climb on it yourself and ride. You were afraid. Do you remember the first time you tried to learn how to drive a vehicle? And, uh, you know, to be able to, you know, put on the key and then you press the turtle and then the accelerator and then you are looking in front and then you are looking at vehicles coming it's like you are shaking what will i do How about that vehicle coming you are afraid but as you do it and do it and do it later now you can be driving the vehicle and listening to a cassette you can be driving the vehicle and talking to somebody you can be dri driving the vehicle and then waving to somebody else out there because now you're used to it but you must start one day and the same thing with prayer the first time you try to do it by yourself after you have had the concept of pray for me pray for me pray for me you've never done it yourself but the first time you're pushed to go and do it by yourself the promise is there god is there the name of jesus is in your mouth just say it the way we all say it and then believe the lord and the lord will answer the first time you do that you'll be a little bit afraid neglect overlook that fear go ahead and ask you will receive 
The first time you're seeking that thing by yourself, you'll be afraid. Am I going to receive? Seek, you're going to find. You know, the first time you come at the door of the mercy of God and you begin to knock like this, your hand might be shaking, your faith might be wavering, but keep on asking and keep on seeking and keep on knocking. You'll just be surprised. The Almighty God say, Yes, I'm coming, yes, I'm coming. And then He opens the door for you like this, and then you come next Thursday, you come and give your testimony. Because our God says it's everyone, it's everyone, and God will not disappoint you. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that has no money, come ye by and eat. Come ye, come ye, come by wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hacking diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, come unto me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. You see, God is impartial. Partiality is often found in the human family because of the sinful nature of man. What you find in the human family you will not find in God. Number one, partiality. God doesn't have that. Number two, favoritism. Favoritism means, you know, A comes, you answer. B comes, you don't answer. Favoritism, no. God never does that. Number three, this one, I don't know whether you have had this word before, but I'll give it to you. Nepotism. Nepotism. What does that mean? Giving something, especially employment, by a person in high position to his relatives. Politicians do that a lot. Once they have this high position, then they overlook all the other qualified people in their community and they bring their relatives to be in point A, point B, point C, point D and all the other positions remaining will be useless positions that do not need any qualification, any skill, nepotism. God never does that and I hope you church leaders never do that. That you look at the scripture and then you are a child of God, a child of God, a servant of God must be like God Himself. That God does not practice partiality, He does not practice favoritism, He does not practice nepotism. He doesn't know about this is my relative, you have that position, this is my cousin, uncle, you have that position. This is my nephew, this is my sister, this is my junior brother. I have that position. God never does that. And you, leaders in the church, should never do that either. We just look at everybody and whatever is available for everybody is given to everybody. Nobody has an edge over another. Number four, preferential treatment. Preferential treatment. Human beings do that. Christians shall never do that. God doesn't do that. Then number five, injustice. Injustice. Number six, unfairness. Number seven, discrimination. You see all those things, partiality, favoritism, nepotism, preferential treatment, injustice, unfairness, discrimination will always cause problems whether it is found in the human family or in the church family. God's word condemns partiality in clear terms and it is not to be allowed any manifestation in our families or in the church. Look at what the Bible says in James chapter 2 verse 1. James chapter 2 we're reading from verse 1. James 2 verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. 
have not the face of the Lord Jesus Christ in respect of persons. Look at First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. I charge thee before God. This Paul the Apostle talking to Timothy, a church leader, a pastor, a teacher in the a teacher in the church. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. You know, that, that's Christianity. That's Christianity. But once uh, a Nigerian who is a missionary favors only Nigerians, even a foreign country. And the nationals will not be given the rightful position. That's what you call nepotism, partiality, favoritism, discrimination. Don't do that. And when a Yoruba preacher, a Yoruba pastor favors only Yoruba people, and then brushes aside the evils and the houses. That's what is called partiality, discrimination, favoritism, nepotism. Don't do that. And when an Igbo pastor favors only the Igbo brethren there, opportunities only to the Igbo brethren, and discriminates against the Yoruba people there, that's what the Lord is saying. That you will not prefer one to the other. We speak the same language. We come from the same province. In fact, there is a, there is a word in dictionary. It's called provincialism. That means because we are from the same province, therefore I favor him. I give him position. And then I don't give those who are not from that same province. Don't do that. Let's be like God. God is impartial and God has no respect for persons and so we too we are going to do it like God wants us to do it I said we will do it like God wants us to do it you know sometimes you have um, some people there they are not qualified they are not doing well and the leader should just replace them but you know even though everybody is complaining so and so is not doing well so and so is not doing it you keep them there. Why? Is that because you are from the same tribe? Or maybe that fellow is giving you some money, some gift. That's why I was saying once again, reject those gifts. Gifts blind the eyes. Make so partial. Make so discriminate. And make so practice this favoritism we're talking about that the Bible says you can't do it. In James chapter 3 verse 17. James chapter 3 verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality without partiality without hypocrisy and so we know that God doesn't practice any of those things in response to prayer God is fair and impartial to all his children that's why Jesus said emphatically everyone that asketh receiveth God is more faithful and infinitely more just than any man that ever lived after giving us a promise, sometimes man in his earthly, sensual, devilish wisdom may find reasons and arguments not to keep those promises. But God is infinitely more righteous and more impartial than man. Most parents, even non-Christian parents, because of natural love and affection, will provide necessities of life for their children. Look at what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 7 I'm reading from verse 11 If ye then been evil know how to give good gifts, good things to children, how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good things unto them that ask him. Today you are going to ask and God will give you good things we come to point number two. Point number two, we're looking at the impossibility of getting 
antithetic answers in prayer. Verses 9 and 10, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 9. Or what man is there of you? Whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? The answer is no. You see many religious people, and this is why you should be very, very selective in the books that you read. And sometimes uh, we cannot even stand in now for even our own bookshop. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, you find some books in our own bookshop, deeper life bookshop. That when you buy that book and then you begin to read, you find a lot of theories of the world, theories of religion. That you have to be very, very selective. And I hope our press, uh, like press, will uh, kind of be very diligent. Uh, if you go to buy books outside, before you put it in a bookshop, you go through. So that we are not uh, giving them something poisonous, something unscriptural. Because there are a lot of books that you read. And then those books are telling you things different from what the Bible says about prayer. These theories are to excuse the unbelief so they can have some comfort to those who fail to receive expected answers to prayer. Some of these uh, uh, so called counselors and comforters and advisors and, you know, these writers in an attempt to unravel the mysteries of life. They say that we may pray for something and God may give us the exact opposite. What they mean is you're asking for something good and God gives evil instead of good. Never. You're asking for healing and God gives sickness instead of health. Never. You're asking for wealth and God gives poverty instead of prosperity. Never. You're asking for victory and God gives you defeat instead of victory. Never. You're asking for joy, the fullness of joy. And then God gives you sorrow instead of joy. Never. You're asking for strength and then God gives you weakness instead of strength. He never does that. You're asking for progress and then God gives you setback. He never does that. You're asking for deliverance and then he gives you oppression. Never. But you see, that's what those uh, teachers, you know, you read their books on prayer, and that's what they say. Some Christians believe such theories so much that they resign their faith and they say, well, thy will be done. Unknown to them, they might be resigning to the will of Satan instead of the will of God. What if Jabez had just said, well, my sorrow, my problem, who knows? God has given me this. And you know, sometimes too, the songs we sing, the songs we sing, and sometimes it, you know, you really have to examine the lyrics, you have to examine the wordings of those songs to know whether it is good or not. You know, some songs, the tunes are very good, don't take my tears or my sorrow away. Oh, what a song, what a song. Uh, uh, the one is those words are bad. Don't take my don't take my tears or my sorrow away, or I might go dry, and then I might just go and do something else. If you take all my problems away, you examine the words of the songs that you are singing, and uh, that is the reason why, as you study the Bible. And then you see in church, in church service, in church ministry, you examine the books, you examine the songs, you examine everything before you project it and bring it to the church. So that we are not just carrying out the theories of men. I pray God will give us wisdom. What if Anna? I just said, well, my barrenness, that, that's all right. The will of the Lord be done. What if David, when Absalom was chasing him? What if David had just said, oh Lord, I don't know whether this is your will. I want deliverance from all the treachery of Absalom, but I leave it in your hand. If you want to give me defeat, I know that's how you answer prayer. Never. 
What if a Jonah in that belly of the whale had given up and said, well, Lord, I will be done. He would have died in that whale. Or if uh, Esther and Mordecai is tired of standing on their right and saying, this is the promise of God for the people of God and claiming those promises. What if they just said, well, whatever Haman wants to do, who knows the will of God? He may want to bring something good out of this evil. Let Haman have his way and let God have his way. What if they said that? But no. That's the reason why as you pray, you will look at the promises of God. You will say, Lord, here is what you have promised. And the Lord will fulfill the promise. You see, if those people had given up like that, look at Ezekiah. Isaiah said, Ezekiah, set your house in order, for thou shalt die. Well, you see, this is the point we are making. What if Ezekiah... I'd be one of those uh, people, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me, prophet. Now, the prophet to pray for him was the person that said, set your house in order, for thou shalt surely die and not live. What if Ezekiah did not remember everyone that asketh receiveth? He that seeketh findeth to him that knocketh, it shall be open. What if for just in Isaiah, don't go away, Isaiah, don't go away, pray for me, pray for me. Isaiah will say, no, I cannot pray for you. God said you surely die. There must come a time in your life when you become so matured. You are able to take the promise of God like Ezekiah. And you are able to say, oh Lord, this is what you promised. And God will add many years to your life. But you see those people, they were not ignorant of the promises of the Lord. And they, just, they didn't just sit back and say, thy will be done. They found out the promises of the Lord. And they stood on those promises of the Lord by themselves. Not to, if they had, you know, taken the attitude of, well, whatever will happen, I will be done. Not only they themselves, but their nation, the whole world would have suffered a great loss. And see the questions that the Lord himself is asking us. Our Lord said in a series of questions, what man is there of you? Whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? What's the answer? What's the answer? No. Are you better than God? If the human parent will not give a stone instead of bread. Don't you know that if you ask him bread from God, God will give that. And then it says, or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? What's the answer? The answer is no. Or if he ask an egg, will he give me a scorpion? The answer is no. Well then, if we're asking for something from the hand of the Lord, that good thing the Lord will give unto us. And tonight, as you ask for something good from the Lord, the Lord will give you in Jesus' name. Before I go to point number three, we need to clear a particular point now. You see, sometimes when, you're, when you see people, you hear what they pray about. Because Jesus said, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. They come before God. They say, oh God. And then they ask what they are asking. You know, some time ago, one young man saw me. He said, uh, Pastor. Can you come into agreement with me so that this thing I'm asking the Lord, the Lord will give me? I said, tell me what you are asking before I come into agreement with you. Pastor, doesn't the Bible say if two of you shall agree as touching anything that we ask, the Lord will give us? I said, please tell me what it is you are asking. Then I can come into agreement with you if it's according to the Bible. He said well, I want you, I'm praying to get married. I said, that's wonderful. But uh, you know, I don't want to marry a Nigerian and African black like myself. I want to marry somebody who is white. Oh, I said, oh, that is a great prayer. I said, uh, have you finished uh, secondary school? No. Did you, have you attended university? No. Have you traveled out of, uh, you know, your state before, even within Nigeria here? Uh, I'm still planning to do that. I've not done that yet. Have you traveled out of Nigeria before? No. 
How is it you want to marry a European, an American, white in color? How is it you, you, that's your prayer request? You see, we must understand the Bible. I'll show you now. Another person came to me now, a lady. I'm telling true, true story, true story. And you know, this woman came, you know, I was uh, counseling, and that's why sometimes my counseling session is almost a waste of time. Sometimes, almost a waste of time. This lady came and came from another city and came to Lagos here. And I thought she wanted something, and she said, uh, Well, I have come, I need prayer. I said, Yes, we can pray. What's the prayer about? And she said, I want to get married to the president of our country. I said, what? Tell me again. And, and the lady was serious. And then she, she said it again. I said, are you a Christian? She said, yes. I said, which church do you go? And I'm ashamed to tell you the, the name of the church she goes. And then she, I said, do you know the president is married already? Do you see the pictures in the newspapers? She said, yes, I've seen that a number of times. And what do you still want? I want to marry the president, even though he's married. You see, the people, the things, they're asking the Lord. That's why you need to understand about prayer. Now I'm going to show you Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to read from verse 9. Or what man is there of you? If his son shall ask, what's that? What's that? Bread. In verse uh, 10, or if his son shall ask, what's that? A fish. Bread, fish. Let's come to Luke. We're looking at Luke now. And we're looking at chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 12. Or if he shall ask what? An egg. Bread, fish, egg. You know what those are? They are the necessities of life. Necessities of life. When you come to God and you are praying, everyone that asketh receives necessities of life. Not that somebody who does not have a bicycle will want to buy an aeroplane. Oh God, you said, he that seeketh findeth. Ask and you shall receive. Knock, it shall be open unto you. I want an aeroplane. Where will you pack the aeroplane? Where are you living? What house do you have? What job do you have? What need do you have of that aeroplane? God has said, we can ask anything. Necessities of life. Bread, fish, egg. You see the people that are asking for things that are not necessary they make a caricature of praying look at mark chapter 6 mark chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 23 mark chapter 6 verse 23 and he swear unto her whatsoever thou shalt ask of me i will give it thee Unto the half of my kingdom. That's Herod promising the daughter. Whatever you will ask of me. To the half of my kingdom. I'll give to you. What did the daughter ask for? The head of John the Baptist. Daughter, what do you need that for? Is that the, a necessity in your life? You see, the things the people are asking for. And then they say, I don't know, but Jesus said, ask, it shall be given unto you. Bread, fish, egg, necessities, not superfluities of life. Let's look at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I do for you? And they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on the right hand and the other on the left hand in thy glory. 
And Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Necessities, not superfluities. To sit on this side and sit on that side. That's not bread, fish, eggs. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. When you are asking. Ask according to the scriptures. Acts chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 19. And saying, give me also this power. That on whosoever I lay hands. He may receive the Holy Ghost. This is Simon the sorcerer. He pretended to have been born again. He was following after Philip. And then Peter and John came to Samaria. And they laid hands on people. But you know this Peter and John. You must know what they have gone through. They had denied themselves. They have forsaken all. They had followed Jesus Christ. And they had wielded their lives. They had surrendered their lives unto the Lord. And they loved God. God more than everything they said were rather obey God more than men what he took these people deep consecration to have the Holy Ghost and the impartation of the Holy Ghost this man no self denial no repentance no sanctification even the salvation was shaky not a real son in the kingdom he came and he said give me this power so that on whosoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost verse 20 but Peter said unto him thy money perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter for thy heart is not right in the sight of God you see you need to understand the scriptures when it says ask seek knock for bread for fish and for egg necessities of life and you're looking at numbers now numbers chapter 11 in numbers chapter 11 i'm reading from verse 4 numbers 11 we're looking at verse reading from verse 4 you open your bible this is very essential very important and the mixed multitudes uh, that was among them fell and lost him and the children of Israel also wept again and said who shall give us flesh to eat the arch watch the Lord had given manna from heaven they had the necessities already and they had the water out of the rock already necessities of life but now they began to lost after superfluities unnecessary things we remember the fish and the, uh, which we did eat in Egypt freely and the cucumbers and the melon and the leeks and the onions and the garlic and but now our soul is dried away there is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes you see in verse 13 verse 13 of that same passage whence should I have flesh to give to all these people for they weep unto me saying give us flesh that we may eat give us give us give us but not for necessities they already had the necessities they were eating the food of angels but they brushed that aside they said no this is what we want Psalm 78 in Psalm 78, I'm reading from verse 18. Psalm 78, verse 18. And they tempted God in their hearts by asking for meat for their lust, not for their need, not for their need, for their lust. So, what we're asking of is not something for a lost. Let's look at Vastachi. Vastachi of that same passage. They were not estranged from their lost. From their lost. But while the meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them. The lost. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're reading from verse 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lost after evil things as they also lost it. We should not lost. Look for the necessities of life and do not you know have a lost desire, inordinate ambition, affection for something unnecessary. 
And then it says in verse 11, all these things happen unto them for examples. And they are reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Romans chapter 7 verse 7. In Romans chapter 7, we're looking at verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lost, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Covetousness is lost in. I had not known lost, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. And then you look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. For they that will be rich fall into temptation and is near. They already have the necessities of life. But I want to be a millionaire. I want to be a billionaire. I want to have mansions. I want to have this. Is that necessity for you? Or is that just lost? They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, lusts which draw men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith, they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And then in Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4. We're reading from verse 18 and verse 19. Mark chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And these are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this life, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts, and the lusts for other things, entering in, choke the word. Choke the word. You must not be asking from something from God that when you have it, you will choke the word from your heart. That you'll not have any interest in the word of God anymore. Give me this, give me this. Eventually, when you have it, you lost after that sin. And then when you have it, it chokes the word away from your heart. And then it says, and becometh unfruitful. We're looking at um, First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. First Peter chapter 2 verse 11 Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. You don't want to have anything from the Lord. You, are not, you don't want to ask anything in prayer that will war against your soul. That your salvation then become unstable. You're not able to stand again. What you are asking for should be bread and fish and egg. Necessities of life. James chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 3. James chapter 4 verse 3. Ye ask and receive not. Ah, but I thought Jesus said, Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. But here it says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. You see, if there is an inordinate ambition, if there is lost, if there is an unscriptural desire, and then you are claiming the promise of God, God said, Jesus said, ask, it shall be given you, seek, and you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. He said those things in relation to necessities of life. And as we're asking for those things that are necessary in your life, you want to get married, that's necessary, you are going to get married. You're married, you want children, that's necessity, you're going to have children. You're taking an exam, you want to pass the exam, that's necessity. And it's going to be done in Jesus' name. 
And then you need to be saved. You want to be born again to get to heaven. That's necessity. You have it in Jesus' name. You want to be holy. You want to be sanctified. This is the will of God. Even your sanctification. That's a necessity. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. When you ask, the Lord will give it. And then you're asking for the power of the Holy Ghost upon your life. It's a necessity for you to be able to witness effectually. And that's the reason why you look at what you're asking. Is this a necessity? You're sick, you want to be healed. That's a necessity. That's children's bread. And as you come to the Lord and you're asking for those necessities, the Lord will answer your prayer. I said the Lord will answer your prayer. But don't pray for an aeroplane. Who needs an aeroplane here? I don't. Do you? I said, do you? Are you going to maintain it? How do you get a pilot? And where are you going to fly to? And you just park the thing there just for pride. I have an aeroplane at my backyard. That's, that's not a necessity. All those things. You want to marry a white, a white woman. Uh, you know, anybody there? And then, uh, you know, that's that lady there. You want to marry the president of the country. Where are you now? Is that a necessity? No. And that's why when we study the Bible, we study our right. And then God, when we're children who love the word of God, who know the word of God, who base our prayers on the word of God, God will answer our prayer. I'm just looking at you tonight. I'm looking at the great blessings of God that will pour upon your life tonight. The moment you begin to ask for those things, God loves you so much, he's going to answer your prayer. We come to point number three now Insight into God's affection for his people Insight into God's affection for his people In Matthew chapter 7 We're looking at verse 11 If ye then being evil Know how to give good gifts Unto your children How much more Shall your father which is in heaven Give good things to them That ask him tonight is your night in Luke chapter 11 verse 13 Luke chapter 11 Reading from verse 13 If ye then being evil Not to give good gifts to your children How much more Shall your heavenly father Give the Holy Spirit to them That ask him He will baptize you in the Holy Ghost You know he's talking about his children Who are the children of God Isaiah chapter 63 Isaiah chapter 63 I'm reading from verse 8 For he said Surely they are my people Children that will not lie Children that will not lie So he was their savior And if you are one of those children That no lying anymore No hypocrisy anymore No deceit anymore And no evil anymore Children that will not lie The Lord is waiting for you to come with your request tonight Great miracles and blessings are going to pour upon your life First Peter chapter 1 verse 14 First Peter Chapter 1 verse 14 As obedient children Those are the children God is waiting for He wants to answer our prayers But he says you must be as obedient children Not fashioning yourselves According to your former lusts In your ignorance You come with a clean heart With a pure heart With a sincere heart There is no lust There is no covetousness There is no asking for superfluity You are asking Asking for necessity, and it says, as obedient children, you can come. Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 1. The children of the heavenly father be ye therefore followers of God as dear children precious children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor those are the children the Lord is waiting for and he's saying all my children you can come 
come and ask me if he been evil not to give good gifts to your children how much more shall your father who is in heaven give good things to them that ask him who are the children of God those who are followers of God those who walk in love but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as become a saints those are real children of God neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient rather but rather the giving of thanks first John chapter 3 first John chapter 3 verse 8 he that committed sin is of the devil are those children of God I said that those children of God those who are living in sin, embracing sin, enjoying sin, defending sin, spreading sin, living bad lives, sinful life, not born again, not children of, they're not children of God. He that committed sin is of the devil. Those who steal and those who uh, do the things that God says we shouldn't do. They commit fornication, they become pregnant, they, they commit abortion. And it says, he that committed sin is of the devil. They steal money belonging to other people, belonging to their company, their corporation. It says, he that committed sin is of the devil. The wife stealing money from the husband. And the husband going to the a wife's purse and stealing money. And the children going to their parents' pockets and stealing money. Those are not children of God. We shall settle that will be not false. If he then being evil, not to give good things to a children how much more shall your father your, he must become your father first your father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him but you know if you are you're living an hypocritical life a sinful life an adulterous life a covetous life and a, lo a, a life that lusts after evil things if you are living a hypocritical life a deceptive life at home in your place of work with your neighbors and as a tenant you will not pay your house rent to the landlord and then you are the one that will change the NEPA something, the NEPA bill those are not children of God if we're going to ask and we're going to receive we must come to the Lord with a clear conscience sins are washed away, sins are taken away he that committed sin is of the devil and hatred is sin, malice is sin, fighting is sin, violence is sin, beating your wife is sin. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that my do what? Tell me out loud. Destroy the works of the devil, all those sinful characters. Tonight, the Lord will destroy them. Whosoever is born of God sinneth not, does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. You know, the children of the devil cannot just come to God and say, God, Jesus said, I seek, knock. He said that to those who are children of God. Repent, turn away from sin, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him take all your sins away and let the Spirit of God bear witness in your heart. You are now a child of God. Then can you come? Then will you come with confidence before the Lord and the Lord will answer your prayer. Because it tells us there, who and whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. The Lord wants uh, that change, and then when that change has taken place and your conscience is not clear, and the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart, you are a child of God, tonight you will pray and God will answer. In verse 19, and hereby we know. That we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, if our heart condemn us for stealing, if our hearts condemn us for fornication and adultery, 
if our hearts condemn us for stealing the stationaries in your place of work if our hearts condemn us for stealing mobile telephone useless thing the people steal if our hearts condemn us for lying, for deception if our hearts condemn us for messing up with the lady you say you want to get married to you're still in courtship if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, if there's clear conscience and clear heart Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Look at verse 22 now. Once the sin problem is taken away and your heart is cleansed with the blood of the Lamb and you're living a pure life, upright life, holy life, righteous life by His grace. Verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him. We receive. I said we receive. Because we keep his commandments and do those things which are right, pleasing, pleasant in his sight. The Lord is telling us, let's settle all those sins and let the blood of Jesus cleanse us, wash us, purge us. And then we come with a clear conscience and we can then come before the Lord and come with the promise of God tonight. And the promise says, ask it shall be given you. Give me an amen. amen. Seek and you shall find. Amen. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Amen. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you? If his son asked bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If he then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father which is in heaven give good things to his children that ask him? It's now time to ask. Will you ask? Are you one of those uh, pray for me prophet, pray for me prophet? Are you one of them? No, you want to ask and you are going to pray. Would you want to stand up? God bless you. You want to ask the Lord. If you are still a sinner, you have not been born again, you must ask him for salvation. Talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, here am I today. If you are not born again, how shall we escape the judgment of God? If we neglect so great salvation, in Jesus' name we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the clear teaching of your word tonight. And we pray what we have learned today will put you to practice in Jesus' name. Your promises are waiting for us. You are our Heavenly Father, you are waiting for us. The Lord Jesus Christ is waiting for us. And the Holy Ghost is assisting, helping every one of us that we can take the promises of God in our hand and we can come before the throne of grace. And you will answer our prayer tonight. Answer the prayers of your children in Jesus' name. For those who do not have the assurance that they are children of God, coming to church, they have not come to Christ. They know the Bible, they don't know salvation. And the Spirit of God is not bearing witness in their hearts yet that the children of God, they're still living in sin. Oh Lord, I pray, as they're asking you for forgiveness and salvation tonight, give them salvation in Jesus' name. Lord, you have assured us in your word, if any man be in Christ, a new creature, all things are passed away and all things have become new. I pray that that change, that transformation, that new life, that eternal life, give to everyone asking sincerely tonight, in Jesus' name. And the victory that comes, victory over sin, victory over temptation, victory over the world that comes with that salvation of the righteousness that comes as you come into the life, into the heart of everyone give everyone, asking you sincerely tonight, in Jesus name, 
And Lord, the necessity of holiness, the necessity of sanctification, the purity of the heart, without which we cannot see you as those who are saved, those who are children of God, those who have the witness of the Spirit in the hearts of the children of God. As they ask you for that holiness and sanctification tonight, give them, Lord, in Jesus' name. What can we do? What will we be? Whether the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. How can we walk effectively? How can we evangelize effectively? How can we win souls to the kingdom of God? Whether the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why you said. If ye been evil not to give good things to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. We're asking you tonight for the power of the Holy Ghost. The anointing of the Holy Ghost. The fire of the Holy Ghost. The dynamite of the Holy Ghost. For those who are saved and sanctified. Baptize them. Immerse them. Deep them in that Holy Ghost. And give them the power fire of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus name. That every one of us will be able to go out and witness with effectiveness. And with power and authority and anointing and unction. And Lord, sinners will not be able to resist a word anymore in Jesus' name. And now that we have sought the kingdom of God and your righteousness. You said all the other things are going to arch unto us. Oh Lord, every need of your people, physical need, material need, family need, domestic need, professional need. Any need we have tonight, give to your children in Jesus' name. Those who are sick, stretch forth your healing hand and heal them. Those who are pressed, stretch forth your delivering hand and deliver them. And Lord, we pray you break every yoke. You destroy the works of the devil. Any manipulation of the devil in any life, anyone, destroy them in Jesus' name. That Lord, body, soul, and spirit, spirit, soul, and body will receive your mighty blessing even from tonight in Jesus' name. And now, Lord, we pray the spirit of prayer pour it upon us. The spirit that will pray by ourselves, that will ask you by ourselves, that will seek by ourselves, that will knock by ourselves, that will not be waiting for pray for me, prophets, before we can receive from you. Oh Lord, we pray, bring us out of the old covenant into the new covenant, into the new privilege of the children of God, everyone from tonight in Jesus' name. That from tonight, praying, we will pray. Asking, we'll be asking. Seeking will be seeking. Knocking will be knocking. And Lord, every one of us will make it a practice of asking in faith. Asking according to your promise. You'll do great, mighty things in the lives of all your children. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty, glorious name, we pray. Amen.